Welcome to a very exclusive edition of the Dateline Downtown Podcast. I am your host, Juan Hernandez, and today we have a very special guest, Adam Scorgi. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me on. And I'm not that special, but I'm excited to be here. Thank you You're again. special to us. <laughs> Adam Scorgi is the producer of such documentaries like The Union, The Business of Getting High, and I Am Bruce Lee. You worked on that too, right? Yeah, I Am yeah. Bruce Lee. And, and currently he is promoting The Culture High, which will be premiering at the time of this recording, today is October 24th. We're we'll premiering, premiering the night of, and I have not seen it yet. Well, but just, it just came out a few days ago, so that's understandable. I'm, very, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I'm pumped to come, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, I, I another doc I was fortunate enough to work on. I'd um, love to tell your audience about because I'm proud of it. Is The Good Son, The Life of Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Right, That's right. one that's a... And powerful, powerful doc, but I'm most commonly known for the two that you mentioned mm -hmm. there, the union, the business behind getting high and the culture high, because that is, you know, me and a small group of um, guys from Canada, director Brett Harvey, Stephen Green, and a few other producers are really, you know, as we were talking before we started recording that, you know, we, we, <laughs> we got lucky. We went out and worked our and when I say lucky, there's a there's an old expression that came from an athlete that it's like the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. It was a golfer that said that. So I mm -hmm. do believe like, I mean, we we worked our fucking asses off. We spent four years grinding. We did everything you weren't supposed to do on the union. We borrowed family money. We went and produced a documentary ourselves, which documentary in the film world, just the D stands for death as well as documentary. That's just not. <laughs> and uh, we borrowed family money and a lot of it. And uh, actually last night it was really, uh, I'm, I'm here visiting my parents in Texas and my stepdad and my mom are the ones that gave me the money for the union. And we originally borrowed $240,000 and I've got that down recently to 55,000 left owing. And my parents said, uh, no more paying us back. You've worked hard enough. Mm -hmm. um, we never paid for you to go to college. So we're looking at that as kind of like your college investment. The fact mm -hmm. that you've paid back that much money, we're super proud and we know it meant a lot to you to pay that back, but they're gonna let me go from paying back the rest which is it's I mean it was a really emotional night with my parents they're just mm -hmm. proud and it was like man that's awesome and you know but I still have to pay them back the 150 grand I borrowed to make the culture high so <laughs> <laughs> I'm about in the same amount of debt I was originally but yeah I mean we were talking that it just you know luckily we we, we made the union and it because of technology and the way it has come the film went viral. It, it, it's been viewed well over 10 million mm -hmm. times worldwide if you go by all the YouTube counts and Netflix and DVD and everything else. And it became this cult phenomenon that we just could have never expected. And it's a tremendous honor. So that's what led us into the culture high is that we did not want to do another cannabis-based film. We didn't want to do another one about drug policy. Mm -hmm. But the audience demanded it. Because we built this online audience kind of organically and accidentally through Facebook and, and social media, which that's a funny story in itself because um, Facebook at the time when it was coming out was not like it is now where every business and things like join us on Facebook and mm -hmm. Twitter. When I started on Facebook, people made fun of me. They're like, why are you spending so much time on Facebook? This stupid thing to talk to girls like and stuff face. like that. Yeah, they were making fun of it. They're like, what is it? And I was like, but to me it just connected because we, we did the union. First of all, we went way over budget. And two, we didn't think about marketing and all this other thing. So once it was done, we thought a distributor would pick it up and market it, but that's not what distributors do. Most distributors, especially when they're buying indie doc, they buy it and they put it on the shelf and that's it. They might right. get one reviewer or like a basic mm -hmm. advertisement so your film never gets seen. So for me, Facebook just connected. I was like, wow, I can message thousands of people with one click. Like, how else am I gonna do? Am I gonna go out in the corner and hand out flyers and say, hey, watch my pop movie, watch my pop movie. Mm -hmm. People are gonna be like, stupid hippie, not watching this shit. I mean, imagine if you did this 30, 40 years ago. It wouldn't exist. It wouldn't the union, no one would know of it, and the culture high would clearly not exist, like even 10 years ago, mm -hmm. because it was funded through social media, it was demanded by the audience, so we went to Kickstarter and said, okay, you guys have sent us all these emails and Facebook posts and everything else that you want another one. We need this much money to move forward, and they answered loud and clear. We raised 240 grand in 42 days. 3,500 people said, fuck yeah, here's my money, get this film made. So just even the financing for the second film. It would not be possible if it wasn't for the new age of technology. It was, the first film was discovered and became a cult classic through the internet. The second film was funded and went into production from the internet. And that's why 
we did this interesting release platform where we have a hybrid. We have a traditional release in North America mm -hmm. through Phase 4 Films, which is now Entertainment One. Uh, and then we have Vimeo, where everywhere else in the world no longer has to wait. We said, no, we want everyone in the world to be able to get the film at the same time. So on Vimeo right now, you can watch the film um, anywhere in the world other than, sorry guys, Australia and New Zealand. We pre-sold Australia and New Zealand to Eagle Entertainment, so they're releasing it in January, so you have to wait a little bit longer. But everywhere else, Philippines, Norway, South America. Um, hang on, I heard my... Sorry, guys, my little man's iPad is pretty loud. I'm going to turn it down so we're not interfering our podcast here. One of it. You continue. That's correct. Um, you mentioned, actually, I've read something the other day online regarding the culture high that it's currently being submitted for consideration for an Academy Award for, well, best, for the best documentary category. Is that true? Or? It, well, see, here's the weird thing about that is you can't, you're not supposed to advertise that you're doing that. Oh. So we are, we have done everything in play mm -hmm. to be able to submit, right? Mm -hmm. we, we did a screening. We did a one week in New York and LA, which is your qualifying run. Right. And then we submit. So, but there's, there's so much more to it and you're mm -hmm. not supposed to actually like announce, but someone did, I don't know if our publicist put that out or whatever, but right. we are, we are trying. We're mm -hmm. seeing that, uh, uh, and I mean, the reviews, especially for pot film have been amazing. I mean, we've been ripped by a few people, but it's just going to come, right? The Hollywood oh, yeah. Reporter. Critics. Hollywood Reporter, <laughs> LA Times, and Variety really gave us a slacking. But uh, Newsweek, New York Times, Film Journal, LA, uh, uh, several other outlets gave us great reviews. We had one from Hunter, the call, Hunter College, the Hunter Word, gave us a, just an absolutely smashing review. So um, can't go by the critics. I was actually surprised we'd gotten so many positive reviews to start. I was waiting for a lot more because, like we even talk about in this film, mm -hmm. With media, a lot of the times it's not even that, you know, you can show people facts, but the facts won't penetrate because people are defending their egos. They're defending their point of view and their badge of identity. And that, when you see some of these reviews, not to call anybody out, but they're targeting the issue much more than they're targeting the film. And if you really read it, you can blatantly see, because they use some very derogatory terms saying the only people that'd be interested in this would be stoners, which is such an insult because, I mean, we had Richard Branson interview, we had the former deputy drug czar sit down with us, former Supreme Court judge, Judge Jim Gray, former LA narcotics officers, like, it's ridiculous. We had super, super intellectual people sit down and educate us on how things are really going. So to use those terms, mm -hmm. it's a play on words. But if you're clever with words, you can really, that's why debates never get anywhere, right? Because it's just two people defending their egos. Mm -hmm. And you never get somebody in a debate being like, wow, that was such an amazing point of view you brought up. I've now changed my perspective. The whole thing is to defend your ego until the bitter end. You can be shown, you can be like, this pen is red and everybody can clearly see it's red, but you're gonna defend it. Well, no, 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 it could be considered maroon. It could be considered another color. Right. Do you think that's a, a generational type of thing where no, that's no. a human culture thing, and that's what we get into in this, is that it, it, is all, it has been ever since, I mean, if you look, it was, other things have come with the similar argument. Uh, equal rights for men and women in the workplace, you know, uh, equal rights for, rights to education for minorities and everything, right? There was always one right. side arguing the other side, right? Mm -hmm. There's always someone, and, and, you know, till the very end to where you start looking on the wrong side of history, it's pretty dumb. Like I would hate to be the final guys if you look back in the history book that were arguing that women shouldn't have equal rights in the workplace or that minorities shouldn't be allowed to have rights to education. If you were the final people making but there was people, they were standing in Congress trying to say, nope, we shouldn't do this. You look like an idiot now, right? And that's what's starting, it's not quite there, but with drug laws, we're starting to get to that place because the one thing with drug laws that just does not make sense, and here's the thing I say in a lot of interviews from the people, that I interviewed with is that, okay, if you if you think cannabis, which is the main focus of our film, has harms, which it does, just about anything has harms if, you, if abused. But those harms are not as harmful as taking away your right to education, giving you a criminal record, preventing you from getting back into the workplace and preventing you from traveling. Because that's what happens to you currently in most states of the United States if you get caught with it. So this premise of we're gonna protect you from harming yourself, Therefore, we're gonna harm you further with criminal penalties and punitive damages. 
you start to think and you're like, how the fuck did we ever think that was going to prevent somebody from addiction problems? Mm -hmm. Especially when you understand the science of addiction. Right. Substance is such, the actual substance is a minor part. The majority of it is what causes someone to become addicted to a substance in the first place. What trauma did they have as a childhood? What shapes their brain to get addicted to a substance in the first place? So when you really look at it from that picture, even, even the most hardcore conservatives or prohibitionists, are, they're having a tough time arguing how it's right to criminalize our own population for doing something that is less harmful than the punishment itself. Mm -hmm. That, I don't know, if you, if you can be a logical person and tell me how that makes sense. To me, it doesn't. And then it, to get into the corruption side of it, which we talk about in this, and sorry, I'm rambling, I do this. No, 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 um, please. <laughs> the corruption side of it is that law enforcement has financial incentives to go after minor drug dealers and trafficking. Mm -hmm. And you know, people listening right now are like, well, good, they should. No, 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 because that takes their attention away from real crimes that I consider. Murder. Rape, murder, rape, molestation of our children. They don't get proceeds of crimes or seizures of assets for those crimes. So precincts have a financial incentive to be like, listen, we're only going to put 20% of our effort into murders, rapes, and molestation of children. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is going to go into drug crimes because drug crimes, we make money. And then we can go to the state and to the feds and we can get more money for those proceeds of crime and those asset seizures that we have. So police and the easier crime to get is not to go bust a murderer or rapist or whatever. That's tough because you have to have DNA. You have to have concrete evidence, motive, conviction record. Mm -hmm. You know what's way easier to get? simple possession or minor trafficking of somebody on the street corner, especially a minority in this country because the, the laws are very racist. Right now in the United States on a federal level, whites, uh, Caucasians do drugs at slightly higher than uh, other minorities, yet minorities, blacks in particular, are charged at four times the rate of Caucasians on a federal level. And in certain states, they're charged at sometimes six to eight times the rate. So they're all doing it at the same rate per 100,000. So there's no excuse for that other than there's racial profiling when it comes to police and law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? Who's the easier target? To go to somebody that comes from an ep upper, you know, um, uh, a poor economic situation in society to where they can't defend themselves in court, mm -hmm. that person's gonna get charged every time. Because I don't know if you've ever been through the court system. I've had some experience there. Mm -hmm. Courts are won by money, right? If you have a drug charge and you have money, you'll get off. If you have a drug charge and you don't have money, you're fucked. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get charged. Then you're gonna have a tough time getting back into the workforce because now you have a federal record. You'll lose your right to getting funding for education and you won't be able to travel to other countries. Mm -hmm. So good luck on trying to get your life back. Yeah. Yet if you're a celebrity and you do the same thing, it's a big joke. Oh, oh so-and-so yeah. was caught with cocaine again. Oh, the president was caught with crack. Oh, this person was, the mayor of Toronto was busted on video for smoking crack. He can still travel. He can still become a, a prime minister. He can still run for office. Bullshit. The average person that gets caught with crack can't do the same thing, right? There is a clear, and we say this in the film, the drug laws make it very clear that there is one law for the rich and powerful and one law for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that we try to talk about in our films is that it's not about smoking weed and everybody should be able to get high and the right. That That's such a small part of it. The big part of it is that the drug laws are very racist. They're also very economically driven. And that is the problem. If we live in a democratic society where everybody should have the right to the same, you know, same success in mm -hmm. the American dream or the Canadian dream, those things need to change. Right. And all of this resonates because uh, myself, I'm a criminal justice major here. Perfect. And so you understand this. I, un I, under I understand where you're coming from. And I actually did an internship this past summer at the juvenile probation for yep. Harris County. You'd be, st you'd be stunned. I mean, I'm sure you know already. Mm. Most most juveniles have a simple petty uh, petty crime for what do you call it? What am I trying to say? Like drug charge or trafficking? Yeah, or, a small drug charge for yeah. marijuana. It's it's insane. Where you're overlooking the actual problem. You know, they might have addiction problems, uh, problems at home, and you know, it's it's very tough when when people get lumped into just one category. Well, and then think about, and this is the thing for me, after interviewing some of the world's most renowned addiction specialists and law enforcement and people that have worked on the other side right. of this, say you're a person like, we've all made mistakes, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Maybe not everybody's broken the law, but everyone has made a mistake. And you know, that's what good parenting is, is you get taught a lesson and then you get given an opportunity to correct that mistake. 
Now, if it's a mistake that did not harm someone else or damage somebody else's property, like a drug charge, and you're trying to get your life on track, like you wake up in the morning because people say, well, they need to suck it up and not break the law. Well, okay, that's easier said than done if you come from a poor economic situation where you have nothing but shit surrounding you. You have bad parenting, you have no good role model, you have no way to get yourself out of that. And then when you wanna get yourself out of it, you've got a criminal conviction, a federal offense. So even if you wake up and you're like, that's it, I'm gonna stop hanging around the friends I am, I'm gonna get my life on track, and then you go out there and you're hustling and you go for a job and do you have a criminal record? Yes, I do. Yes. Deny. Next job. Do you have a criminal record? Yes, I do. Deny. There's only, especially if you're young and you don't have good moral guidance to get out of this, and everywhere society is just rejecting you, rejecting you, rejecting you because you made a mistake. Same kind of mistakes I made when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I just didn't get caught, right? Or some, the president of the United States and the two previous presidents did the same thing, but they're now the president of the United States. They didn't get caught. So that's why it's okay for them. So this is what really frustrates me with this is when I know how hard it is. I've been there. I've had some, you know, I got into fights when I was younger and I got charged with assault and those, those charges got dropped, but, that's because my family was able to engage a lawyer and go through that process, right? I couldn't imagine if I didn't have that because then I'd be screwed. I wouldn't be here doing this podcast right now because I have a criminal record. Right. I wouldn't be allowed to travel to the United States. I'd be barred for years, but I had a family that could help me. So I can't imagine if you're a young man or young woman and you make a mistake, same mm -hmm. mistake that I personally admitted that I've done or that great leaders of this country have done and you don't have someone that can help you get back on track. Mm -hmm. You've experienced the just good luck it's next to impossible. Like you right, won't be right. able to, and then you're gonna start having resentment for society. Cause you're gonna be like, man, look, I was 19 or whatever. I made a mistake mm -hmm. or I was 18 or 17. Like, geez, I'm trying to get my life on track, but no job will give me an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I don't have good role models. I can't win in the legal system. I'm just getting screwed. I have no money. So I just have to plead guilty and try to make some, you know, plead to get out and be able to get my life mm -hmm. back on track. Good luck, you're fucked, right? And then what do you do when you can't get back in? You're gonna go more legal right? Because now you got to survive, you're human, mm -hmm. right? And then maybe now you, you know, wind up and you get some girl pregnant or you're a girl and you get pregnant and now you've got to fend for your kids. So you got to do what you got to do to make that happen. Ryder. Shh, buddy. <laughs> Sorry guys, my, my little man here is uh, driving his motorcycle around. This, uh, is, this is raw and uncut. This is how we do it here. Yeah, this is how we do it. We, we bring I, my, my family who's out. So I brought the little man. So you got the added sound effects in the back. The main thing that we're getting here is that, you know, hard, hard work does pay off no matter what you do. If you're a documentary filmmaker, if you're going to college, if you're if you're a single parent, you know, doing both at the same time. Luckily, I'm just going to college mm -hmm. and doing internships during the summer and stuff like that. But well, I actually put that on my business card has creative hustler on it. Like that's I, I put that on my own because I find a way and you're going to whatever that is. You know, there is going to be tons of struggle. If there isn't struggle, then you don't know what success is because that's part of it, right? Seeing the down lets you know when the ups are there. There's an old expression, I believe it was Larry Holmes that said it originally, uh, or Joe Frazier, they said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die first, right? And if you think of the context of that as like, okay, everybody wants a success, but everyone forgets how hard it is to work there. Right. And often, you know, that's where I look at a whole bunch of people when you see somebody blow up in whatever industry it is, and you're like, oh man, that guy just came out of nowhere. Look back and look how hard that guy was hustling. Right. And you'll probably see if it's a musician, he was slanging CDs when he was 12, right? Mm -hmm. On this, like his first album. You know, I read a good thing, whether you like Lady Gaga or not, a very interesting thing was brought up on Howard Stern's interview with her is that when she went to a place where there was a potential record artist or a record label for her to see, and she'd be like, man, I got this album, I got this single, you gotta listen to it. And the guy would be like, great, where is it? She had it right there, ready to go. I have it in a thumb drive, I have it in a single, I have the full album. Like, what do you, you want? Know, <laughs> what do you want? Not missing that opportunity. And that's called being prepared. And that's what people forget in a lot of times, especially the entertainment industry. They think it's like, oh, I'll just randomly be discovered or something mm. like that. No, like anything else, it's being fucking prepared. And when you're prepared, I've met this with the young artists all the time. They'll come to meet me and they're like, I got this great idea for a movie and it's like this. I'm like, awesome, where's the script? And they're like, well, I don't have one yet. I'm like, well, then you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. Right, because an idea is just an idea until you put it on paper and people are like, well, I'm not good at the paperwork. I'm like, you think I am, right? I didn't graduate from college because I sucked at fucking paperwork, right? But do you know how much paperwork I have to do now? 
shitloads, more Tons. than a college semester. People Tons. would want to quit if they saw the shit I have to do. <laughs> but you know why I'm able to do it is because I love what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So trust me, I buckle, I get up in the morning, I'm like, oh my God, I have to do all these government applications and Canadian media. Like I want to shoot myself. Mm -hmm. But you have to. But do I know, it. like nobody else is going to do it for right. me. So I have it. to get it done. But when you do that, the thing that does help you when, and I, I talk to the, because I meet young artists all the time. If I have time, I will always sit down and mm -hmm. give people because I hope they don't make the same mistakes or I mm -hmm. hope it can be a little, e I hope that if I share the little bit of information I know that it won't be as hard for them. I hope they can, you know, bounce over some things that I had to go through. I, I like to pay it forward. As cheesy as that sounds, I really hope that, you know, and I don't do it for any kind of ulterior motive, like hopefully, well, I mean, I do hope they get successful and then down the road they remember me and they have like a hit show and they're like, hey, Adam, you came when I was no one and I'm gonna have you back on now. It keeps but you grounded at the same time. Exactly. It keeps you grounded. And I just, I just, I feel good. Like, you know, what you put out is what you get in and if you keep doing for other, it just, I think that's the whole reason why our films have been successful is mm -hmm. that, you know, people sit down with my crew and I and they're like, man, like, you guys are just like regular dudes from Canada trying to make it work. And I'm like, yeah, I think that's what everyone's trying to do. So they connect that and then they want to support. They're like, man, I want to see you do, I'm going to go buy your thing. You know, I downloaded it originally because I didn't know, but after meeting you, I'm going to go buy it. I'm going to tell everybody they should support you. Right, right. But what it does when I, and going back, when I meet with young artists and they have an idea, whether it's for documentary, TV show, podcasts, like put together your business plan and pitch package, right? There's no excuse now. Literally, you can go to Google and be like, how do I do this? Whatever it is, like, mm -hmm. how do I write my first book? How do I put together a podcast? How do I do this? That shit wasn't around when I was younger, right? Or here, here. how about you go play out there, buddy, and play in your iPad? <laughs> he turned on the printer there again. That's but fine, that's fine. What it helps you do as well when you put together this business plan is it actually helps you formulate your idea into something tangible, right? Once you put together, whether it's a pitch treatment for a doc or it's a script for a film, by you sitting down and forcing to do the stuff that sucks, it helps you to have it nailed. So then when you have that opportunity, like a Lady Gaga or something, mm -hmm. you meet that guy and he's like, hey, I really do like your idea. Do you have a pitch? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do right mm -hmm. here and then when he's got the objections because you're gonna get it no matter how great you think your idea is mm -hmm. everybody thinks they have the best movie in the world and the best idea for a film everybody does but then when you've formulated this thing you're ready for the objections when people say well i kind of like the idea but wasn't this done before and then you're like i'm glad you asked that one this is yes there have been these films and you have subject a b and c and but this, this is, is how, how mine is different, is different mm -hmm. right? Right, right that's what doing the work that sucks of putting it on paper and putting it into a script treatment outline business plan for a podcast mm -hmm. helps you to identify what makes you different and what i like to do because i originally came from an acting background you don't have to do this but i think it's really good is literally sit down with a friend and role play if you're pitching this, if you have an opportunity to pitch to someone that could change your career, whatever that business mm -hmm. is, even if it's not in the entertainment world, have a friend or your parents or somebody role play on what they're gonna do so that you're so ready for that interview, right? Like have, be like what, pick apart your own resume for a job or thing and say, what are they gonna try to say? Okay, they're gonna try to say this. Okay, they're gonna try to say, pick five things and then pick what are the three top things and rehearse those so that like, literally as the person says it, you're smiling underneath me like, mm -hmm. I'm so ready for you to ask this fucking question. I can't ready to knock it out of the park. Right. And for me, that's why it's funny because actually, even when I go for, you know, when I was still hustling and doing, you know, day jobs and trying to be creative, I used to love the interview process and people were like, man, you're crazy. I hate the interview process. But me, I came from an acting background. I went to film school in New York for three years. Like I'm used to auditions and getting rejected all the time. Mm -hmm. So literally when I went in and I had a resume and as you guys have seen this podcast, I don't shut up. So it's easy for me to flip the gab. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> so <laughs> when I would go in for these things, like literally there was times when an employer would sit back and they would try to be like, so, you know, I noticed this on your resume, but what about this? I'd literally be thinking like, I actually rehearsed that the most. I'm so glad you asked that. And I would, and I literally I'd use, I, I also did sales for several years. So mm -hmm. I'd use the sales regime and I'd be like, Juan, great question. I'm actually really excited you asked that because, right? And that's a whole sales spin where mm -hmm. you're not knocking them. You're actually saying that is a very good point, but here's how I'm gonna sell you and how that point doesn't equate when it comes to me. Mm -hmm. Were there any act? Oh, sorry to interrupt. No, you. go, man. Were there any good. actors in particular that inspired you to 
There's a ton. And actually, mine are some of the unusual ones. It's not always like the guy that's the most talented. Like, everybody's like, well, I love like the Johnny Depps and mm -hmm. like the. I actually like some of the guys that you wouldn't expect. They succeed. Like, I'm a huge fan up, you know, and he did fuck, but Arnold Schwarzenegger right oh, absolutely like i mean what that man did and i think bill bird does he does a bit on this it's mm. actually hilarious yeah. the epidemic of gold digging horse <laughs> <laughs> but he brings up some very like great comedians he brings up some very valid points mm. of things that you know where he said here's a guy that came from a tiny tiny country right austria i don't know what the pot but it's tiny it's smaller in can than canada for population and size he comes he revolutionizes working out before him there's only something like 600 gyms in the United States. It was not a big thing. After him, there was like 3,000 in the first year. He revolutionized men's bodybuilding and fitness and the form of an action star and what they look like. Right. You know, Then he, not only did he do that, then he goes into acting, can hardly speak fucking English, right? And everybody's like, mm -hmm. you're joking, you're, right? You're not gonna make it. You cannot make it. He was told, you'll never make it as a bodybuilder, right? And he was like, no, I will. They're like, you don't even like PE and stuff like that. You're not like, he wasn't athletic like a jogger and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. people were like, you're a wimpy, frail kid. Like bodybuilding, get out of here. Revolutionizes bodybuilding. Now you see his picture all over. Everywhere. Gold's you go to any, go to like Gold's <laughs> gyms, go to any gym in the world and there's probably an Arnold picture, right, right? right? He revolutionized men's bodybuilding. Then that wasn't enough for him. He's like, no, now I want to get into acting. And people are like, you're an idiot. You can't speak, you can hardly speak the language. You have a horrible accent. And not with that you're, body. And with that body, you're <laughs> yeah. this big meathead. It's not gonna happen. He, re still to this day, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody has made more money in action films than him. Could correct me if I'm wrong, but I still believe he holds the record. He's up there, he's up there. If he doesn't hold the record, he's like number two or three. He's re up there with Stallone and Yeah, revolution. Yeah, all those guys. He's, you know, revolutionized bodybuilding. And then to top it off, he's like, oh, I'm gonna get into politics, right? And like mm -hmm. Bill Burr and things like you want to get into politics of a state you can't even pronounce the name right <laughs> and he does he wins and then to kick it off he marries a kennedy the ultimate royal family of you know another country he comes to the united states and marries into royalty after accomplishing all this other stuff now given that we won't get into you know sucks he did whatever with his maid humans mm -hmm. make mistakes right, that's a whole right. other issue right. but let's look at what he accomplished right he came from this tiny country became got into politics i don't even know how that's legal from like passport issue stance like i, I don't <laughs> know how he even you do that you go like and bill burr puts in his thing he's like i work out he's like nobody gives a shit right <laughs> he's like i lift weights nobody cares right that is amazing and then somebody else that really inspired me is vin diesel because there's another guy, his real name was Mark Vincent, and actually at my modeling agency in New York, they were one of the first people that discovered him. Mm -hmm. When And he said the same thing, I'm gonna be an action star, I'm gonna be and people are like, whatever, you know, you, I think he's originally from um, New York, the Italian guy, and they're like, get out of here. He was a bouncer in a nightclub before he uh -huh. got noticed in, um, what was the movie, there's a breakout role for him, I think it was Broiler Room with uh, Giovanni Ribisi, Ribisi and uh, Ben Affleck were there. Oh, right, 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 right. There's a small yeah, indie yeah. film that mm -hmm. went, I think that was what first got, and then of course Pitch Black, right, is what sent his career mm -hmm. huge. But he was, you know, I like those guys because they're the guys, to me, they're like the everyday regular guy that you think, fuck you, you're not gonna make it. Or you're a doorman and you're gonna become a big action star, right? right? And Arnold's and, living proof, I mean, I bought his book over the summer, still haven't read it, yeah. but it's split into those three parts, bodybuilding, Acting and politics. Politics. And, it's huge, and he comes from a tiny book. country where that just shouldn't have been possible, right, right. right? He came from a tiny country, couldn't speak the language. Like, that's against all odds. Mm -hmm. Like, if he forget can do the mistake. Man, if, if he can do it, anybody can. Yeah, and, yeah. and I love when he, and his, he has a pretty great online speech, if you want to watch it, where he says, don't be afraid to fail. Right, I saw that. Right? It's yeah. such a great line because you are going to fail way more than you succeed, but everyone's only going to remember what you succeeded in, mm -hmm. right? That is the part that's you know, other than controversial stuff. It sucks at all that, like, what happened later yeah, on. Because that, it happens. You know, and, you know, a, a thing and another thing Bill Burr brings up good about that, right, where him committing adultery and everything, people say that's atrocious. And then, yes, it's a, like, as Bill Burr says, it's a piece of shit thing to do and it sucks. But you, it's got to be tough when things are thrown at you. I hear this when people are like, oh my God, like, Justin Bieber did this or these guys. I'm like, man, we can't even identify what it would be like to be that famous and have women begging to sleep with you, right? Like my only vice, I was never a big drinker. I was not big, like I didn't, I know weird, I did two pot films, I don't really smoke weed and 
Ironically. I was never big into, I had a little stint in high school. I did mushrooms for a while and I, I enjoyed that because I really, the self-reflection really took down my ego as a young mm-hmm. you so know, really testosterone you. field guy. Yeah, in high school where you think you, you're invincible and you rule the world, it was nice to be shaken to the core and realize you don't rule shit. It's like right? Joe Rogan says, you're just a tiny speck. Yeah, you're a tiny, you realize, you're like, holy, and that's why people say they freak out because it's like, oh, you realize you're not the fucking center of the universe, mm-hmm. right? You are just a speck. But, um, you know, me, women was my, I fucking love women, but I was never good with them, right? I had no game in high school, got shot down all the time. But I couldn't imagine to the point where you're coming, you know, you're world, fam- world famous to where you're walking out and Playboy bunnies and Victoria's Secret models are begging to sleep with you, right? You can say you have a religious background or you're this, but until you're, or, or you're, you would never do that and this and that, but until you're put into that situation, you can't even comment on it because you've never experienced it. You'd be like, well, people are like, well, I've, I turned down a hot chick once or whatever. Like, maybe <laughs> what, you did what? once, right? And maybe because she was fucking crazy. But think about you go to, there's nowhere you can go, you know, into any town in the world for those uber celebrities. And people are begging. Like, that's what, there's a great line. And I, I think it's got to be true for them where Charlie Sheen, someone asked him in an interview and they're like, why do you pay to have sex with, with escorts? He's like, no, no, no. We don't pay to have sex with escorts. We pay escorts so they leave after we've had sex with them. He's like, the problem is with women with when you're famous is after they they want they want to get pregnant. They want to latch on to you. They mm-hmm. want to, and women out there. I'm not saying all women. You know, there's but unfortunately there's a large percentage in our culture that like that is their goal. Right. They hear celebrities are going to a club. There's a whole article done on this in either Vice or Maxim uh, called Bottle Service Girls where. They pay the, it's in, it's in the back there, bud. Um, they pay nightclub doorman big money to let them know when big celebrities or sports athletes come in mm-hmm. because their whole goal is like, I'm going to hook up and get set up for this one. They don't have plans to go get an education. They don't have plans. They're a hot girl that knows that, you know, people pay to have beautiful people around them, men and women. And if they can go roll that, I mean, essentially... Kim Kardashian, is that any different? That, that's essentially how she made her career. And now to do a sponsorship, it's a million dollar sponsorship for her, for her to endorse a product. And essentially all she did was accidentally get her porn video with her boyfriend online. And I say accidentally like that because if you just go and do it willingly, then you're a porn star and you don't get famous. But if you do it accidentally where it leaks, then it works into other things. Accidentally is a key word here. Um, Moving on to talking about the documentary in the union, there's an interesting interesting quote that Rogan Joe Rogan mentions when you mention private prisons. He just freaks out. He's like, yeah. "Private prisons? What is that? What are you talking about?" And yeah, I got the I got the same reaction. I'm like, I'm like. It's there. Well, and that's the part. Joe was such a nice, refreshing part in the first one because you have all these professionals and everything, and then you have somebody like Joe that what he's saying is bang on. And mm-hmm. what people don't understand, I mean, we all do because we listen to his podcast, sure, so you sure. understand just how intelligent this man is, mm-hmm. right? Joe is a super intellectual and often not given credit for just how intelligent he is just because you don't know him. If you listen to him, you know. Mm-hmm. But what he says in the film is so bang on, but he also adds that comedic humor and some mm-hmm. swears because the way he says it, I've only seen the film about a thousand times. He's oh, like, yeah. he's like, what the fuck? We have private prisons? How the fuck did that happen? How did society ever allow that? He's like, that's a bad, bad sign if we're letting people profit off of putting people in jail. And then we have this again in the culture high. We have Jank Uger from the Young Turks that says, he's like, you know, we've forgotten how ridiculous some of the things we do are. He's like, so we're gonna give people a profit incentive to put people in cages. Hmm, I wonder what's gonna happen. Oh, more people get arrested and go into cages, right? Mm -hmm. And as we were talking earlier in the podcast, what's the easiest arrest to get and convict someone? Simple Simple possession. possession. You can go out, they have it in their pocket, boom. All the evidence I need, you're fucked, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you have the money to defend yourself in court, you're getting charged and you're probably gonna go serve some jail time depending on what state you're in. And the interesting thing about private prisons is even if the police do a great job and they lower crime in that area, say they lower it by 30%, doesn't matter. Private prisons demand the state and to keep the, the prison 80 to 90% occupied. So even if the cops do a great job in lower crime, the prison still has to keep its occupancy rate. Mm-hmm. So what's their easy target? Lower economic people right. with simple possession. That's the easiest. 
Here's an example of how this is happening right now that was brought to me by the former deputy uh, police chief of Los Angeles, Stephen Downing. He said, you know, for those people that say, oh, the drug issue doesn't affect me, in Los Angeles, there was 4,000 rape kits that were waiting to be tested. And for those that don't know what a rape kit is, it's a DNA forensic test that pretty much if someone did rape someone and they've got their DNA, you mm -hmm. got them, right? It's what you need to get right. them. And you know what those are being held up by? Right now, there's only so much money and so much money for the labs for testing, and they're filled up with people that are getting charged for breach of probation for drug use. So when you say this doesn't affect me, if you are someone that has, I have a daughter, she's eight, and if she was molested or raped, that would be priority number one. But you're telling me that her rape kit would have to sit idle because we're overloaded with people getting charged with breach of probation for simple drug use? It's insane. Like, I don't give a fuck if they're even doing heroin in their house, right? I want whoever touched my daughter to get charged. Mm -hmm. But the simple fact is they don't put the money towards that. I said there's no financial motive for them to go after that. Right. And that's why there's an organization that's in our film a lot of these ex-cops are now part of called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, mm -hmm. right? These are all cops that have been there. They've seen how they're doing far more damage to society than helping. That's where I know all these talking points. It's not because I'm that smart. I'll tell you guys right now. I'm actually kind of dumb, but I've Reading interviewed- the paper right here. <laughs> yeah, I've interviewed the best people in the world. That's the thing is I've interviewed the very best that have lived it, that have been there, that have fought it, that are now like, that's why this organ, the fact that this organization even exists, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, has 55 chapters around the world. It has former South American presidents involved, former DEA, former prosecutors, former undercover cops, former narcotics officers, all that saw they were doing more damage than they were helping in the drug, specifically with the drug war. Because they're like, I don't see how taking a kid that was smoking weed in his dorm room out of an educational, like, you know, Norm Stamper, the former police chief of Seattle, talks about a specific moment where he was kicking in dorm room doors because there were small dealers deal selling in the dorm rooms. He's like, but you know what they were doing when we kicked them in? Studying. They were smoking weed, studying their books. We kick open their dorm rooms. We took away their right to education forever. They weren't doing anything violent. They were selling a product that was in demand to the students that almost everybody did anyway, right? He's like, and then now they're in a cop car saying, holy fuck, my parents are gonna kill me. He's like, meanwhile, I get a buzz on the radio about a domestic dispute where a guy's beating the shit out of his wife, but I've got to prosecute this kid that was smoking go. weed in his dorm room, right? <laughs> that this is who I arrested. He's like, and now what did that kid do? He, I taught him to have a blatant disregard for the law because he was sitting in his own dorm room being like, okay, you know, I do sell this illegal product on the side, but you know, if it's not me, it's gonna be somebody else. In fact, he took over from somebody else. And now he's taken out of that right to education where he probably would have grown out of it. He was getting his degree. Once he had his degree, he probably would have got a legit job like a lot of other people in legit businesses did. They did illegal stuff when they were younger, didn't get caught, and now they're not doing it anymore. You know, and then he's put into the justice system where now he's gonna learn the real hard way of what society's like. And then he's gonna have, like you said, because he's already got disregard for the justice system, he's probably gonna go more illegal because he's not gonna be able to get his life back on track. And now he's gonna do some real illegal shit. And this is where, and I'm giving spoilers to the culture high, Spoiler. where we talk about how wrong the drug laws are and how they target people in poor economic situations. And you have to do some Google search here, guys, but you can find it. HSBC Bank, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, a giant bank, was caught laundering billions of dollars for the drug Mexican drug cartels, billions. Which means that bank has, knowing how many people have died, we're up to 70,000 deaths because of the drug conflict in, South, in Mexico, more than has been in, uh, uh, since we've been in Afghanistan of US soldiers, far more, it's almost double. I think if you go for the stats, I know it's 70,000 in Mexico, I don't know the war stats, but it is more. Yet you hardly hear about it. And here's the thing, HSBC laundered billions, caught, red-handed, pleaded, and they had to pay a fine of $1.9 billion. Wow, well, when they say they're going after the big drug dealers, there's no bigger than that. When you're laundering for Mexican drug cartels, you have blood money on your hand. You have deaths on your hand from the bank. Right. Nobody goes to jail. Nobody serves one day in jail. They pay a fine, which to a bank, it's fucking nothing. They probably wrote the check as soon as they came out of the courtroom. They're like, perfect, nobody goes to jail. Here you go, here's your check, boom. We'll just, uh, we'll never do it again. Meaning they'll just be more clever next time they hide their money. 
Yet, and we make this comparison, a woman in the film, woman of four, single mother, caught selling $31 of marijuana is given 10 years. And that happened in the years. last two, 10 years, right? Because it was her second offense or whatever. So how does that make sense? Billions of dollars, meaning that you contributed to people getting their heads cut off, families being murdered, mutilated, nobody goes to jail. Mother of four sells $31 of marijuana, taken away from her kids and put in jail for 10 years. That is not a good justice system. And yet we have stuff like alcohol and tobacco, which oh, are just, far that, more. That, well, that, that's the whole ridiculous part of it is that if harms is your concern, if you're like, okay, we need, but we need this. We need to protect the children. We need, mm -hmm. we don't want deadbeats smoking weed all day. Okay, if harm is your concern, you want to prevent harm and you should make something legal based on the harms, well then I'm sorry here people in Texas, that the Texas diet should be made illegal tomorrow because it kills five times more people in America every year. Poor diet and physical inactivity kills roughly 150,000 people in the United States every year. You know how much all, drug, all illegal drugs combined kill every year? Here's a stat that nobody thinks, they think it's just a massive number. <laughs> it's less than 30,000 people. Wow. It's not a huge, that's everything. That's crack, crystal meth, cocaine, all of them mm. is less than 30,000. Now, given in that stat, there is far less people doing drugs than there are people right. eating poorly, right? So there is a big um, difference there. But the harm to society is much greater with our diet. But that's your right as a free sovereign individual is if you want to eat shitty and not work out, that's your rights, your body, you can do that, mm -hmm. right? Same with if you want to use a substance like cannabis and expand your consciousness using cannabis, as long as you do not harm somebody else or damage other people's property, that should be your sovereign right as a free individual. Our consciousness is the only thing that really makes us human. And if we don't have the right to experiment with it or do as we see fit, then how are we really free? Right, and I'm not saying everybody needs to do drugs to expand. Some people use religion, some people use meditation, some people use working out, great. But not everybody body works the same. Some people need a little help. Some people might use that help from, that's why people do comfort food and eat like crap. I do it when I travel, I eat the shittiest food and you can bet while I'm here in Texas, I'm gonna have some queso and some great Tex-Mex. I love that shit. Yeah. But when I'm in my workout streams, I can't eat that shit. That's horrible for you. Or fast food that's all over. God, like, I don't even know what hamburger meat is in fast food places anymore. It's probably <laughs> rats, but it tastes delicious. And that should be my choice to eat it. And that's the thing, and as I was saying kind of earlier in the podcast too, is that, you know, the whole idea of that we're gonna prevent you from harming yourself from using cannabis because it can have harmful effects if abused. Carcinogens in the lungs, you know, it can have a whole bunch of side effects far less than tobacco or alcohol, just plain and simple, just mm -hmm. way less, but it can have harmful effects if abused. But to criminalize you for using it is far more harmful. So that whole thing of we're gonna sell you like, we need to prevent harm, therefore we're going to harm you further by using something that you're potentially causing harm if you abuse it and use it way out of, just doesn't make sense. And in fact, how we were ever convinced it's actually a pretty great job of the government to convince us that we shouldn't even even be in control of our own consciousness, that that should be regulated and controlled by the government and they should decide how we can and can't be uh, in control of our own consciousness. That's ridiculous. 1984 all over again. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's ridiculous. But you have some very, very intelligent people that know how to do so. And we talk about this in the culture high, and here's another spoiler alert, is that when Nixon first brought on the war on drugs, in the 1970s and really made it a big business and sold it as that, they'd already done research and found out that treatment works and incarceration doesn't when dealing with addiction. Mm -hmm. But the mass amount of financial support they got was overwhelming, so they went with the war on drugs. And let's, let's realize this, boys and girls, people out there that are maybe studying politics, We've learned very clearly in the last five to 10 years that politics is a business. In fact, 95% of people that win on the federal level, it's the person who has more money that wins. Doesn't matter if you're a conservative, liberal, a Democrat or Republican, you have more money, you win. Business is politics. So politicians are not gonna run on a campaign that's not gonna get them elected that's really for the people. They're gonna run on a campaign that's gonna get them elected so that them and all their, their, all their constituents get paid because if they don't get in, they lose their jobs and they have to go to a new place. So a politician is only gonna be the hero when the swell from the people is so big that he looks like an idiot if he stands against it. Mm -hmm. 
like I mentioned earlier, like mm -hmm. women's rights in the workplace, equal rights for minorities to education, gay rights for marriage and all those things. When the swell is so big from the people that the politician's gonna look like an idiot standing against it, that's when he's gonna come and say, well, I think it's about time that we um, allow women in the workplace, right? Because he wants to win, he wants to get paid, he wants to get into office. Because if he loses, his political career could be over. Or, you know what he's gonna have to do? He's gonna have to go to another political party, which means he might go from Republican to Democrat or conservative or to liberal or wherever. And that's where this whole game is fucking bullshit. They get you caught up in one side or the other. These guys all work. If you look back, a lot of the times they're jumping from whoever because one governor didn't get elected, so they had to go to a different party, mm -hmm. and then he was just a junior member at the time, and now he's going to work for another governor or another senator. Make up your mind already. It's a business, <laughs> but it's right. a business. They're going to uh -huh. go where they get paid. Just like if you and I lost our job tomorrow, what are we going to do? We're going to go find a makeup job, right? right? Politics is no different. So when you're spending this big money on politics and you're getting all these donations in the form of lobbyist groups, um, nobody invests in politics because it's not a good business. They invest in politics because it's a great fucking business. So if they give you $100 million, they're expecting to make 400 in return. And that's why big companies, if you see them, they invest in both parties. They don't give a shit if Republican or Democrat wins. They're going to put $100 million into both so that either way, that fucking pipeline's going through your state next term no matter what, right? Whether Obama wins or Mitt Romney wins, doesn't matter. Somebody's winning. Somebody's winning. <laughs> Interesting point you bring up. Um, we had a, a story in our last issue titled Marijuana Penalties. I think you'll find this very interesting. Um, I'm going to read some quotes here. Republican incumbent Devin Anderson followed her Democratic competitor's lead and announced plans to lessen penalties for first-time marijuana offenses. Starting on October 6, first-time nonviolent offenders caught with under two ounces of marijuana will be given the opportunity to avoid jail time by performing eight hours of community service or participating in a drug awareness program. And she goes on to say, our goal is to keep these individuals from entering the revolving door of the criminal justice system. Our tagline is no jail, no bail, no permanent record if you earn it. It's not that catchy, but <laughs> we can save up to $10 million a year, folks, a year, folks. We think that taxpayers deserve to have their money spent wisely. And she asserted that her plan would apply to all minor nonviolent marijuana infractions, not just first time offenders. She also stated that under her authority, offenders suspected of mis misdemeanor possession of marijuana would be cited, given a court date, and penalized by being assigned community service. Finally, they're waking up. This is here in Harris County. Good. They need to start doing stuff like that and nonviolent. Like, see, and there's the thing that people never get with this when people are like, well, I don't give a shit. Marijuana is not for me, blah, blah, blah. It was like, yeah, but your taxpayers' dollars are paying for these people to go through the system. Right. Right. And I don't want to see that. I'd rather see go to schools, education programs, addiction clinics, treatments, like anything. Put it into anything. Mm -hmm. You know, we keep fun. All these schools seem to be having problems. Well, maybe not in Texas because your, your school tax that you guys pay is ridiculous. That's why your housing stays so cheap here. But Everything's bigger in Texas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the school tax is crazy. Yes. <laughs> my, where my parents live, they pay $33,000 a year in school tax. Like my, um, 10 of my houses in Canada don't pay that much property tax. It's insane. Ridiculous. But they, it, it, but again, this is coming up now because the swell, you know, the horror stories when Colorado and Washington legalized mm. haven't come true, right? 40 right. years of being told like, oh, it'll just be crazy. People will be doing crack in a week. They'll be killing people and raping babies. It hasn't come true. In fact, petty crime has gone down by 10%. Violent crime has gone down by 4%. They put $12 million back into the education system. Mm -hmm. They've done, like, it, the, they've raised over $150 million in state taxes. They've done, it, it honestly is almost like a miracle. Like, the stats are incredible. And you're trying to get opponents now, trying to pick one stat. They're like, well, but this guy that ate an edible crashed his car and killed somebody. It was like... <laughs> Yes, just like the idiot that dro drank too much and killed the family too. Like, what are we outlawing alcohol? Or no. Ex great fucking example. <laughs> texting is. W there's nothing. The studies have shown that actually being on your cell phone texting is far more dangerous than any driving under the influence of, course, of anything because you're looking away for minutes at a time sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yet we don't make phones illegal. What we do is we put a law in that really penalizes people. And actually, if you want to talk about a law getting stricter, and I'm guilty of this too. I'm not trying to say I'm above it. I make the mm -hmm. same mistake. 
I think the texting law should be really fucking strict because lots of people are going through red lights, they're killing families, doing all that. I'm not saying we should make phones illegal. What I'm saying is though, if you're caught texting and driving, mm -hmm. it should be right out of the gates, major fine, 500 to $1,000. Then I think the next time it should be more. And then after that, you should look at criminal penalties, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is very dangerous and I do it. I'm guilty, I'm admitting. Hey, I'm not saying I'm better well. than anyone. I do it, Try but I shouldn't. To. I have children, it's really stupid of me. And you know what? If I got spanked really hard like that, where it's like, boom, here's 500 or $1,000, trust me, I, I ain't fucking doing it again, mm -hmm. right? But not right out of the gates with criminal charges, right? But if you do it a couple times, mm -hmm. then yes. Or if you do it, or if you do it and then you hurt a family, then they should really look like alcohol being that, okay, your insurance is void and stuff like that, right? Like you should be punished for doing something that can hurt others, right? Like. Save your phone for when you get home. That's mm -hmm. when it should be used. And I mean, and especially now in an age where we're stuck on our phones all day. All day. We're just being oh. bombarded with information. Man, I'm trying to, like, that's something that's really come with me that I've seen with the culture I releasing and the amount that the audience connects with me and you know, I try to get back to them. Like yourself, you just reach out to me on Twitter, right? right and I get right. back, I try to stay. Can you believe the, how we got in touch? The interconnectivity is, is cha I mean, that's how my career, I don't know if I'd, I'd like to think I'm a talented enough producer that I would still have a career without this, but I don't know if I would because of my whole career. My first film was discovered on the internet. Mm -hmm. Second one was funded. And the community like this is why we have a sellout here in Houston, Texas. Like, you know, I've always connected with audiences like this. And I think it goes a long way where people are like, wow, you know, this guy's just like me. He's just trying to, support his family and do something he loves to do. Like, I, you know what? I downloaded his work, but I'm gonna go pay for it because I, mm -hmm. I'd like, but I'm finding I really am having a tough time balancing, right? Mm -hmm. And life is all about balance. And sure, I am struggling sure. with that now because, you know, I have children, I have a beautiful wife and I have a family and I'm, I'm getting so caught up in my phone. Like literally now, you know, when you get up and you have your daily routine, mine is like, I get up, I get the kids ready for school. And then I have to sit and look at my phone and manage my phone because it's just like, oh my God, I have 52 emails. I have hundreds of social media things like, who do I respond to? And if you're a negative piece of shit, I'm not gonna respond to you. I'll just tell you that right you're now. Right away. I just don't have time to deal with you. But if you're positive, you're trying to be, hey, constructive criticism, I love, but if you're just someone that's gonna try to insult me, mm -hmm. I really don't have time for you. So, you know, and in fact, if you have time to write me, I think your life is pretty boring and you, you need to find, <laughs> you yep, need to go after your passion because if you're just gonna take the time to write someone because of something wrong, but I don't get a lot of that. I will say, honestly, mine is 98% positive. It's amazing. But I'm, 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 I'm having to learn how to balance that. It is, it is tough. And I can see how people that have really had, I mean, I'm a nobody from Canada that has, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work on some really great documentaries and you know, there's a big cult following and I have a, you know, there's a social media following there, but I can't imagine if you're someone that's on these scales that has like millions of Twitter followers and you're in the public eye all the time. Like I get it now when I was interviewing a lot of our talent, you know, and people's schedules are always so busy and I'm like, come on, like you're that busy for an hour? No, I can see, man, I'm that busy over the next month. People are like, hey, you know, like, can can you write this, uh, you know, I wanna do a Q&A with you, can you write this thing down? I'm like, honestly, man, I'm not the greatest typer or writer. I don't have time to answer mm -hmm. 35 questions via typing. That'll take me like a full day to make they'll, sure. They'll call you off for spelling and oh, stuff like that. Yeah, and and fuck like, the spelling. Okay, like, here's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> when you call me out on spelling and shit on Twitter, Go fuck yourself, seriously. Because <laughs> I am, okay, here's the thing, people are like, you use the wrong there. I'm like, okay, first of all, my grammar's not that good. You got me, right? I was never very good at school. I'm not that great. I'm typing in 140 characters, probably as I'm changing my son's diaper mm -hmm. or taking him to school or I'm at my daughter's hockey. Meanwhile, I'm getting 35 emails, trying to keep my wife happy, trying to do my job at the same time. So I'm sorry I used the wrong there when I tweeted, yeah, right? What are you doing? Yeah, give me a break, <laughs> man. It's Twitter. Yes, if I was writing a blog and I was writing a thing and I had grad, absolutely should be called out mm -hmm. but it's my personal twitter if you are that pissed off i didn't use the right fucking there unfollow me seriously right. do not send me that i that's one thing i will i have snapped on people that have been like you didn't use the right word i'm like dude 15 other people retweeted it and favorited it mm -hmm. they got what i meant yeah, they take a fucking chill it. pill i used the wrong there or something there right or the wrong r like give me a break i was texting as i was going trying to make it fit 140 characters meanwhile i guarantee i was doing 10 other things sorry 
that shit drives me. The cool part is, is I actually have such a cool Twitter following and stuff that a lot of other people attack those people for doing that. They'll send pictures <laughs> of like a cat with a Nazi outfit. They're like, what are you, the Twitter Nazi and stuff like that, right? And I was just like, yeah, thank you, seriously. It's just the little things that it, it's annoying. And I, I admit I'm bad. I have really bad grammar. I struggled. I had ADD. I still have ADD mm -hmm. and I was never good at English. I had teachers in high school that didn't give a shit about teaching me. I finally had a few good ones in my later. I remember it wasn't until like my senior year of the year that someone actually taught me how to write a proper essay. Mm -hmm. I used to just write, I had passion, so I'd write, but like I'd be all over the place. And finally a teacher was like, Adam, has anyone taught you the proper structure of an essay? Like your opening statement, then your defending argument, your mm -hmm. supporting things, and then your conclusion. And I was like, what, you mean there's a format to it? <laughs> Right, like in grade 12, I got learning. Yes, no, I'm not saying I probably didn't, wasn't paying attention in other classes because as Juan and I were talking about earlier is that, you know, the interesting thing that we're learning about education is that not everybody can be taught the same way. So when you lump 30 kids into a classroom and expect to write on a chalkboard, 50% of them don't learn that way, right? I am one of them. I'm a visual and audio learner. You right. put stuff in video for me, you do audio stuff, I can pick it up and retain it. You write it on a chalkboard, as soon as you write the, I'm bored already and my mind is wandering. I'm looking at like, oh, I wonder how they built this roof and I wonder, I wonder what their lighting bill is like. Like my mind is gone. You've lost me instantly, especially if it's a subject matter I don't give a shit about, then I'm gone. So, you know, and of course I'd have teachers, they would just give me flunky marks. Yep, you failed your essay. Yep, you failed your essay. Yep, you failed. Well. <laughs> Instead of saying, hey, I'm thinking you haven't, until I had Mrs. Schellenberg in grade 12, and she's like, uh, I'm thinking no one's taught you properly or took the time. Mm -hmm. And then amazingly, I got my best mark in English ever because I actually had a teacher that realized I had a learning whether you want to call it a disability or difference in the other kids in the class. And I needed a little extra attention because I didn't learn that way. Mm -hmm. And you know what? She had heard horror stories because I was, you know, teachers are no better than students the way they talk in this calf room. I've heard stories about they talked about me 10 years later, how I was the worst kid ever and blah, blah, blah. Hey, you know that kid, Adam? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, me and my buddy Vic, we were like the horror stories. Like, and literally, Ms. Schellenberg told me this. She's like, Adam, I was new to the school, and when I told people you were in my class, literally teachers are like, oh my God, you might want to transfer schools. This kid is so bad. Oh, she bad? was like, she was like, I was terrified of you. She's like, I heard you were just a, she's like, but you were one of the biggest charming surprises prizes because she treated me with respect. I would never disrespect a teacher that treated me with respect. And she actually tried to help me. So the worst thing I did in class is days when I was over exhausted because I would stay up late, I'd maybe sleep in her class. But I never interrupted her, I never disturbed her, I never did anything wrong. And then I really did try on my essays and stuff. I worked on it, I tried and I did well. And she was like, wow, she's like, Adam, you, I got my best for me. It seems awesome. I know for other people, it was like a C plus. I was roaring that I got that. Other people were like C plus. Trust me, for me in English, that was amazing. It was like getting an A uh, in my senior year. But I had a teacher that I connected with. And it was funny because just actually just the other day, my best friend Vic, who was my partner in crime, in uh, high school, he ran into one of the teachers, Mr. Woodworth, it was an awesome teacher. He did a, a, a class, a marketing class, and he he really believed in us and defended us and everybody else said that we were just troubled kid. And, and actually Vic went up to him now years later and was like, Mr. Woodworth, I really just wanna thank you for believing in us. A lot of teachers just written us off and didn't mm -hmm. give us a chance. He's like, and you did. And he actually started to cry. He was like, oh my God. He's like, well, thank you for proving me right. Cause he's like, I heard that you're a branch manager. And he's like, and I heard, you know, cause this is a small town. He's mm -hmm. referring to me. He's like, and I heard Adam's like a Hollywood celebrity now. He's like, so, so thank you for, <laughs> and I was like, well, not a Hollywood celebrity, but I, you know, I've been in the, in the local press a lot. So, but it, 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 that all goes back to kind of what we we're talking about with the drug. Like, you know, I've seen, I wasn't, I didn't do, I didn't smoke weed in high school and I rarely drank, which was rare. Everybody else was boozing like no tomorrow and drinking, smoking cigarettes. Drinking like fish and stuff. Yeah, I, I boxed competitively, so I, I didn't do that. But, you know, I used to fight lots was kind of my outlet. I used to, you know, that was my way. I was really insecure. Um, you know, I didn't, I really didn't take to other people picking on my friends. I was game to get, you know, and in Canada, we didn't have weapons. So you didn't have to worry about someone getting shot or stabbed. The worst thing was two guys went outside and maybe somebody else jumped in and Stooped it out. that was it. And usually went to high, like, uh, actually it's a funny story because my, one of my daughter's best friends, uh, uh, Caden, um, her dad and I, like, we're all great family friends. I went to their wedding of only 20 people, very limited. And his tooth is still not, because where we got into a fight and I beat him up in high school and I, I broke his tooth in half, right? But now we're buddies and we laugh about it, right? In fact, you're joking because my daughter kind of thinks they're her, his boy's handsome. She's like, oh, and I was like, Lane, I was like, I'm gonna trust you 
to tell him that hands off. And he's like, oh, you're leaving that on me? And I kind of looked at him, I was like, I am, or it's round two, buddy. And he was like, oh, 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 we're going back there, hey? But I like that model of like, you live to fight another day. You know, you went out, you do, we shook hands a couple weeks later, your buddies, it was like, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. That's changed in culture dramatically. But, you know, I saw, going back, sorry, I got off topic there, but, you know, in schools, you know, when you, teachers gave me a chance, I excelled. Right, I, I did good. I put in the effort. I turned things around. It's very rare when you get that. Very rare, There's right? Not that many teachers out there. No, they do that. So now, like we were saying earlier in the podcast, equate that to when you have a drug charge, right? Mm -hmm. Who's going to help you if you have shitty parents or you don't have a father or your mother left or whatever, right? And you don't have that moral support. Mm -hmm. You don't even understand what you're doing. Right, and the mistakes you make, and you're probably gonna pull the tough guy role, like I don't give a fuck, fuck the boy, right. whatever. It's only temporary. Yeah, yeah. like as you're young and you don't get it, but you know, I saw personally just with teachers that gave me a chance, and I could turn things around. Mm -hmm. It's the same with minor possession or drug charges. Like you know, if you're given a chance and educated on how to turn things around, most people will. Right, the big man, like you know, someone believe they're gonna give me a chance. I'm gonna try, but that's the problem. Is usually the people that are suffering. And you'll see this in the culture high, we say this, Dr. Gabor Mate is a world-renowned addiction specialist says, you know, with people that have been severe addicts for a long time, he's like, there's enough punishment in there, in the addiction itself, that we don't need to add punishment onto that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we ever thought that that was the way that we, are, that we were gonna incarcerate our way out of a drug problem in either America or Canada is ludicrous. It really is. It's becoming to the point where just about no politician or someone is, you, you've heard them all say, even the most conservative say, well, what we know, we know what we're doing is not working, but we don't know what to do, right? That's the safe way of a politician saying, okay, if you out me on, you know, harming somebody further than the harms of its drug itself, I'm not gonna really have a good argument. So I'm gonna say, I know what we're doing is not working, but we have to come with a better solution. I don't know what that answer is. Because they're not gonna say anything until they know they can win on an election on that information. And until they have that, until the swell of the people comes up, and that's why even in the trailer, the culture, we say, you know, the great laws come from the bottom up, not from the top down. Right. You know, if you look at all the best laws that have been put into place in America and Canada, it came from the swell of the people and they demanded it. Mm -hmm. We've really come a long way since since the release of the union. It's been, what, seven years? Yeah, seven, seven years. years. Could we expect another documentary <laughs> in the next seven years? A lot of the, people the are aftermath. asking. <laughs> I don't think so. I think we're no. done with, I mean, who knows? Because we never thought we'd do the culture high. So... There's always a possibility, but I mean... Do you think that marijuana will be legalized all over the United States? You have to watch the film for one of our answers in there, but I think it's inevitable that I eventually... I think Texas, Texas will, be, will be on the ballot, but mm -hmm. it'll probably take like maybe 15, 20 years. Yeah, it's not going to... Because you have very intelligent people that can manipulate words and mm -hmm. they'll go to the same things. What about the children? We can't be right, giving them the right. mixed moral message that this is okay to do it and blah, 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 blah. And the masses will buy it. And the masses will buy they'll it. They'll buy yep, it. yep, I don't want my children on that shit. Mm -hmm. Nope, no fucking way, <laughs> right? So they'll jump on that even though, like what's the message we, what's the biggest sponsor of all pro, pro sports? Alcohol, right? You want to send kids a mixed message, stop allowing them to, Pro sports and alcohol should not be mixed, right? But they're the biggest advertiser of football. They're the biggest advertiser of hockey. They're big, and alcohol, as someone that used to own a nightclub and used to sell that shit, no more destructive. There's actually a huge study done in the UK of the most destructive substances to an individual and to society, and alcohol is number one. Ahead of crack, ahead of crystal meth, ahead of cocaine. Alcohol is involved in more murders everywhere in the world than any other drug on the planet. Alcohol is extremely dangerous. It is extremely harmful, right? All those cancers that people are getting when they're later, stomach, liver, mm -hmm. kidney, can all be contributed to the wonderful thing of alcohol. That being said, I don't think when it was under prohibition that that was better. You know, having a regulatory model is best. And I hope with cannabis, they can kind of find a medium way. Like, I don't think that marijuana although it is far less harmful. I don't think it should be advertised as a sponsor for pro sports. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> uh, and I don't think alcohol should either, but that's kind of the battle you have to find with a capitalist country. Maybe just a decriminalized model is the best way, but the problem with the decriminalized model is then you're still leaving the manufacturing production in the hands of criminals and tax revenue is not going into the state. So 
every state kind of like alcohol can kind of fix. You know, you have dry states, you have other ones can kind of find because let's look at the United States as a whole. I lived in Texas and I've lived in New York. You may as well be in different countries, okay? They may be in the United States, but they are completely different. So every state needs to find what works best for them. But as we said, the one argument, incarcerating your own population and your youth is the one thing that is not working in any of the states. So you need to find a solution to that. And using taxpayers' dollars to do that is purely purely not working and should be going to much better things, uh, like education or ad- addiction clinics and stuff like that. That's the one thing that really sucks for a lot of addicts. If they want to get clean, good luck. The free clinics are dog shit. Mm-hmm. And no offense to people working them. I, I commend you for trying but you're not given the resources, right? right? It's like trying to fight against the American military with you know, a John Deere tractor and brass knuckles. Good luck, right? <laughs> you might be able to take down one or two soldiers, right, that aren't mm. looking if you sucker punch them, yeah. <laughs> but you're not gonna be able to stop the US military, right? That is the same way when it comes to addiction. The people I know, and I have, I've had, I've had family members, immediate family members, beat addiction and I've had one of my best childhood friends beat addiction he was addicted to alcohol and cocaine and now he is a super successful insurance broker makes 350 grand a year totally turned his life around but some major things happened for him he had a very supportive family that could pay to put him into proper rehab Mm -hmm. so he went to a very expensive program in Canada that cost about 50 60 grand the average addict in fact 98 percent of addicts don't have that kind of money Two, they don't have a supportive family that's willing to help, that his father was an addict as well. Right. Uh, he, was an, he was an alcoholic and got sober and identified it and knew how to help him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and three, he never got charged. He was lucky, so he didn't have to battle a criminal record. That was one thing he didn't have to overcome. He could just focus on his addiction. And he himself is one of the biggest advocates of my film. He's like, as a former addict, I get your movies more than anyone. Because he's like, if I would have had a criminal record during that whole thing, fucked. I wouldn't be able to travel to the States. I probably wouldn't got hired at the insurance company as that. It would have been so much harder for me to get my life on track. Luckily, I just never got caught with my cocaine and booze and drive and everything else. I was lucky. Eight years sober now, one of the most successful guys I know. My point being is that, and we said this in the union and you watch the last, you can beat an addiction. You You will never beat a conviction. You know you're in the just law. Once that's on there, even if you get a pardon, and I know as someone that travels from the States, Mm -hmm. I have a pardon, right, for my assault. Well, I have my assault charge where it was a charge, but I was never convicted in the charge. But just the fact that I was charged, right, never convicted, it's there. 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 Every time I get a new passport, they're like, what is this? I have to go Mm -hmm. every time I cross the border. They're like, have you? It is there. Every job, I have to clarify. Do you have a criminal? Well, I don't have a criminal record, but I was charged. It never went through. I had my fingerprints done. Like, because then if they catch me lying, then I can, you know, that's fraudulent in my job application. And rest of my life, I have that problem. I open up a company, they're like, oh, you have a criminal. Yes, I have a charge. I wasn't convicted, blah, blah, blah. It goes back and forth. Like, I've seen it. And I can't imagine what that's like. Like I said, I had a family that could help get me through it. I can imagine for a young man or woman that didn't have family support and the money to help with that, Mm -hmm. you're fucked. Good luck and try, the borders now are all digital. Like if you have a offense and you cross, it's there. Mm -hmm. They got you. You know, you're going to Canada, it's gonna show up. You're coming to the United States, gonna show up. And that's our future engineers, future lawyers and scientists. The president of the United States (laughs) admitted to doing lots of cocaine and rather like smoking marijuana. In fact, he was part of the Choom Gang, which was a marijuana smoking club, right? Now, if he was any other and, I, and I'm sorry, I'm pulling out the, you know, if he was another black man from a poor economics, you know, situation that got charged with cocaine, good fucking luck on even mm-hmm. being involved in anything in politics, let alone becoming the president of the United States. But he was lucky. He didn't get caught, mm-hmm. right? Even Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger, Bill and Clinton, we George Bush we has pretty much said, earlier. yeah, George Bush has pretty much said, oh yeah, Schwarzenegger <laughs> smoked a lot of weed and he came out and he decriminalized it in California. So, mm-hmm. But that's usually when politicians do their best work. It's right in their way out. Because at that point, right. they're not worried about getting reelected. They don't give a shit. So on their way out, they're like, I'm gonna do something that's actually gonna help the people. Right, I don't care because I'm not trying to win. I'm not trying to get reelected. So, boom, here you go, done. I'm out. Right. See you. So now I'm remembered on a good note because I did something that helped. Right. Obamacare. Yeah, that's it. See, even the thing about, and I don't know everything about that, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't there some good points to Obamacare though? There are. There are. I mean, there's there's always going to be like you like you said. There's always going to be good and bad things out of it, but. It's helping a lot of people. Yeah, see, and here's the thing that Jank brought this up on the Young Turks, and he's like, the reason why, 
you know, all who were opposed of that originally were so opposed of it is because once it comes out and all the horror stories aren't there, mm -hmm. like, yeah, maybe the first edition isn't right, right? You have to right. mold it, work it, find out a solution that works better for everybody, right? Like lots of laws or like, you know, look at the first Chevy that came out. It's a piece of shit compared to the stuff that's made now, mm -hmm. right? You can hone it, make it better, brakes better, transmission. Same with laws, right? So, but the scare story was if it comes out and the world doesn't end as it was sold, like, oh my God, communism are coming. Ter like the, the stuff that is used is like, well, terrorists will find a way and they'll use Obamacare. And it's like, what are you talking about? But they put you in these scare tactics and you have some pretty intelligent people manipulating the words mm -hmm. very well on TV that get you caught up. And then you find out at the end of the day, like, oh, well, you know what? Actually, like certain people, like actually all the artists that I interview, like Cara Santa Maria and everything, they're like, for me, Obamacare is great because... I'm an independent contractor, I'm an artist, so I don't have a company that covers my medical program. So when you say you have this wonderful medical program, not for artists, right? Until you become a major artist where you make 200 grand a year through SAG, then you get proper medical. But until then, you know, even Cara Santa Maria, she's very well known, right? If you right. guys don't know her, like, I mean, she's on oh, the no, Young yeah. Turks, she was a Huffington Post coordinator. Very, but she's like, I was never worked enough for Huffington Post for any of them to cover me. So she's like, for me, Obamacare is great. I actually have medical now, right? So. Mm -hmm. That's for me, I don't know enough about it, so I don't wanna get down that rabbit hole. But, you know, as Jenk was kind of saying from the Young Turks is that he said, you know, all the horror stories weren't there. And now you can look at alternative programs that might work right. the best for society in general. You've it's opened the, the door now, mm -hmm. right? And now more conversation can happen. Right. They can make better things. Realizing the one thing that was pretty apparent besides the people who were making a lot of money is that the current system was neglecting a lot of the American people, right? You know, mm -hmm. when you heard that, when you heard that, especially me, when I heard that there was veterans that weren't getting covered and stuff for their PTSD, like, how do you go defend, especially in these garbage wars we're doing now for our country, Ryder? Hey, yeah. How, how do you go defend your country and then not be covered under the medical program when you come back? Like, I, I just don't understand that. That doesn't make sense. That makes no sense. I've never me. understood that. Yeah. Never. Risk understood. your life, especially because we're finding out, you know, not that anyone was ever really in support of war, but... Wars now we're finding are much more of a business. When you were doing like world wars and stuff like that, it was not, not, not taking anything away from soldiers. You know, they are amazing mm -hmm. people and braver than me because I do not have the balls to right. go over there and do there's, that shit. There's always a reason for war. Right, there's, they, they find a way, but it, during the world wars, we saw there's more, it was more, you know, they fooled us better where the, the evil Hitler, like people were like, people that would have never signed up nowadays we're like i'm signing up because i'm there. preventing that mm -hmm. fucking gangster from taking over right right whereas now people are like nah, this is kind of an oil issue and they're selling it under the idea of this or selling it mm -hmm. i don't want to sign up but either way when you go sign up like and you defend your country i never blame the soldiers those poor guys are doing and they're under in immense circumstance i, I can't imagine kudos to you guys support for our troops major. absolutely absolutely they need to have great medical plans when they come back. I can't imagine the stress of seeing friends of yours get blown up and having to go kill people and train for that. And like, Jesus, those guys should have the most comprehensive medical plan when they come back. My dad said we used to have a neighbor when I was maybe like two or three. Mm. And I think he had gone to, I think he fought in the Gulf War. Yeah. And he's, he told my dad that he couldn't, he could never sleep. Yeah. Because he was, always, he, was, he was always dreaming about the stuff that he did oh, over there. I, could, I couldn't yeah. imagine. You, you know, you're forced to, especially now, because the enemy isn't like it was in the world wars. Like it was Nazis versus allies. We get it. Bad guys doing horrendous things. But now you have these young kids that are trained to be terrorists, right? And, you know, when I've watched shows like Vice and stuff, I kind of understand. Like, you know, they're looking at, and Canada's involved here too, right? Because we mm -hmm. support the U.S. troop. But... A foreigner is in their territory battling an enemy, right? And they're just caught in the crossfire a lot of the time, right? Mm -hmm. A drone hits, kills their family. So now who's the enemy to them? Who's the terrorist, right? Mm -hmm. They're not educated. They don't have our news. They don't see. They just saw a U.S. drone bomb their house, killed their family. So who's the enemy to them? Right. Us, right? Right. Like, think if that happened to you. You're here in Canada, the United States, you're living in your house, and a drone comes and bombs you. Whoever bombed, that's, that's now the, the terrorist end. to you, right? So now you're fighting children that don't have families, and they're joining terrorist groups like ISIS and stuff like that because their families were murdered. Vice did a very great piece on this, actually, how I think it's in Syria or something where for every drone strike 
they gain 50 new enemies from families that were incidentally murdered or something like that on average. It's incredible. On just like, one airstrike. On one drone strike because the casualties that right. are done because you kill one family, they have uncles, mothers, sisters, they have all these people that are now like, you're the enemy. We weren't involved in this bullshit. We don't like the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood or whoever either, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to just survive. We're just born into this shitty situation. Yeah, we're hanging in there. We're hanging in there and now we got bombed by one of your planes, right? Or your drones or killed by your soldiers. Mm -hmm. So now you are the fucking terrorist to us, right? And it was so interesting to finally hear like brave advice to take that piece, right? Because a lot of people are like, you know, you have to be on one team or the other. But when you heard that, like, if you put yourself in those shoes, like, and I live in a small country in Canada where we don't have a big military and I'm thinking like, hey, I'm here with my family and I went away for work and my house got blown up in the crossfire. Who did it? Right, who did it? Yeah. They're now the enemy to me, right? And that's the thing of where you're starting to see, like, I don't want to take the hippie angle, but how do you ever win a war like this? You're creating more enemies every day because you're bombing people. You got one of the bad guys you wanted, but you hit 15 casualties in the process and now all their families now look at you as the bad guy. Oh, we'll reconstruct. Oh yeah, good, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Good luck on reconstructing. I couldn't imagine, I'm a, I'm a pretty peaceful guy now, but I mean, I mean, anyone, take their children away from them when they weren't involved in the conflict mm -hmm. and now you have an enemy for life that is willing to do whatever it takes to hurt you, right? right? right. Take somebody's child away, away when they weren't involved, man, you've got, and that's what scares me about this is I just don't see, I don't see us winning ever. I don't know how we can because we continually bomb the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. They continually get more, like look, everywhere we went, now there's worse, right? Like Iraq is worse, right? A lot mm -hmm. of studies are showing and not that, hey, I, I can't pretend to even imagine that I understand how all these conflicts go because <laughs> there's so much shit behind them. But, in the same boat. <laughs> but there's so much worse going on in these countries where we've now invaded than it was before. You interview the average people, they're like, man, we want our dictator back, right? Like. Yeah. The problem is in a lot of these countries where socially they're behind us by thousands of years, right? They're so behind mm -hmm. socially. They might have the technology for weapons, but they're really behind in a social way of thinking. Yeah, back to the Stone Age. Essentially, mm -hmm. right, to try to convince them, to get them on board. Like, they almost need dictators. And I'm not saying, like, advocate for dictators. But right, right. You kind of got to have the lesser of two evils, right? Where it's like, okay, you had a dictator, but you know what? You used to be able to travel there, and they actually used to have, like, UN summits and stuff. Like, there was actually conversations going on and now you got rid of the dictator and now it's just a melee there's mm -hmm. just terrorist groups running countries right. there's essentially gangs controlling the streets like there needs to be some type of order and no, no matter the order but some type of order it just it sucks it sucks that we aren't more evolved as a human species to be able to figure a way out of this and then of course you've always got financial interests that are always going to manipulate right. the facts to make sure that we don't get out of it because somebody's profiting really big yeah. from a certain way that's why they wanted the dictator out of there because they wanted access mm -hmm. to those oil mines or diamond mines or whatever else. And that's at least becoming a bit more, we can get that now because of access to information and people having cell phones. And you know, it's interesting now when you see news sources where CNN would be like, that conflict zone's crazy here. And then someone will record on their phone and be like, uh, I'm here right now and there's actually no shooting going on. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, yes, there is like, you know, we're in discussions, but there's not a military zone right now as sold on this mm. new site, right? <laughs> but I know, man, you've been patient. I, I don't know how long we've been rolling for here, but I probably got to take my little man home here. We're coming up almost towards the end. Oh, yeah, cool. But um, this was this was great, Adam. Thanks for thanks for coming down here, making the trip to well, my U of pleasure, H man. downtown. And Adam's making the rounds here in Houston. The Culture High premiere, Houston oh. premiere is tonight October 24th 23rd, 23rd I think 23rd is it 23rd or 24th yeah. what we got 24th. I never know I use my phone for everything now so I never know <laughs> yeah because I flew in the 22nd so 23rd 23rd yeah so my bad tonight the 23rd at the movie grill what's I was it's such a weird up here it's such a weird name studio grill studio grill Movie Grill City Center. Movie Grill. That's so weird for a movie studio. Movie Grill Studio City Center. And you can follow Adam on Twitter at Adam Scorgi. That's A D A M S C O R G. Go visit his website at scorgiproductions.com. You can also listen to his podcast on iTunes, The Scorgi Exchange. It's really good, even though 
I don't know you've been very busy. I've been in hiatus for a little while. I apologize. No, that's the great thing about podcasts. You can always go back and listen to what yeah. you missed. So it's great. You can also find Adam on Facebook, Adam dot Scorgy. Yep. And check out the Bruce Lee documentary. I am Bruce Lee on yeah. YouTube. It's I, on YouTube. I am Bruce Lee. Is, yeah, it's on Netflix and uh, Netflix, the Good Son is as well. Um, so is the Union, the businessman getting high is on Netflix. Right. Uh, right now in the U.S., not Netflix Canada. Uh, and then, yeah, you can also find the Culture Eye. I mean, if you Google it, where you can go, to, they both have Facebook pages. The Culture Eye Twitter is just the Culture High, uh, and you can find the Union or the Culture Eye on Facebook. It just if you search them in the search engine, just the Union, the Business Beyond Getting High, or the Culture Eye, you'll find them both. And as I was saying earlier, I'm pretty interactive, and I try to get back to everybody. It's getting harder these days, but I do do my best. So if you check out my work, I will appreciate it, and I will try to get back to you. And you can also find the Culture High on iTunes and Vimeo. And like you mentioned in a previous podcast, if you can buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, I'm sure you can afford. Man, that's exactly what I, I try to say. We put it on Vimeo worldwide. Five, $5. made it for four ninety nine. You know, if you can buy a cup of coffee or buy a hamburger, you can support us, man. And we need it. We're not. You know, I'm not begging for charity here. We put four years of work into this and borrowed a lot of money from our families to get this film out there. So I get it. If you torrented it and you watched it and you didn't like it, I wouldn't blame you. Don't pay for it. But if you watch it and you did like it, you know, hey, go back and say, you know what? I'm going to give this guy five bucks. I think that's fair. That's a fair price for content. I think that's what Louis C.K. and everybody's charging. I think that's fair worldwide price for anybody to pay. Don't buy that hamburger. Buy the culture high. On <laughs> or Vimeo. just skip one coffee in your day. The average person has at least one. Just one day, say, okay, I'm going to sacrifice my coffee and support these guys. Yeah. Very informative stuff, Adam. Thanks for coming on the show, and you're always welcome to come back anytime you're in town. Thanks, brother. My pleasure, and good luck with the show. And, you know, you guys support podcasts like this, man. It's These guys are going out there and hustling and, and, and